right, good evening, everyone. This is Jeffrey Sisk, and you are listening and watching American Liberty Live. And it's an honor to be with you tonight. It is Wednesday, the 1st of April, 2015. Uh, I don't have any good April Fool's jokes to play on you. Um, I can tell you, uh, those of you that watched the show last night, I do have a very infected tooth. And I'm finally taking some antibiotics tonight. <clears throat> but I was going to cancel the show, and I thought, you know what? I've got such a good person lined up to be on the air tonight to talk about this Jade Helm that I'm going to suffer. So I decided to uh, push through, and I don't know if I'll make it through a four-hour show with you guys or not, but I definitely know I can make it through, um, you know, the uh, segment here to, um, you know, to bring our special guest on tonight to uh, to talk about this subject. And uh, very excited to have her on here. Uh, this is Lori that was the investigative journalist that was on Pete Santelli's video that we played uh gosh i guess it was either yesterday or day before yesterday uh so we'll bring Lori on here in just a minute um she's got a uh, number of documents uh and so Lori anderson very thrilled she could be with us tonight on very short notice and she's going to be here on video Hello. All right. Is that Lori? This is Lori. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Welcome to American Liberty Live. We are on the air. Oh, wonderful. Hello, everybody. It is good to be with you all tonight. All right. And are you going to, uh, did you decide, are you going to transmit video to us or uh, just do a um, an audio call or which one did you decide on here? Uh, well, I have access to either one, so it doesn't matter. All right. However what, you want to do it. What makes you happy? Um, we can do it this way or we can do it video and then if you want I can slide some of the documents if I need to hey that's a great idea why don't you do that and then you can screen share because um, I, I know I figured you probably wanted to do some of that with the shared folder that we were both looking at mm -hmm. um, but it's probably easier for you to scroll through those documents some on a screen share and right uh, and I am broadcasting at a resolution good enough where people will be able to actually see that out there so okay wonderful absolutely so uh there you go good to see you <laughs> let me let me click mine here good so get two-way going there there you go oh i can see you now that's right there <laughs> how you are go. you doing tonight i'm doing good and i i gotta tell you you know this this uh, number one i appreciate you coming on a very short notice and uh, not a problem and being on here you know obviously we've had a lot of listeners and viewers have been very concerned about jade helm Yes. Um, and, you know, the, the way we approached it was in the beginning, let's just let this information trickle in and, you know, let's see what happens over this, this you know, last week. Um, and then obviously, you know, a lot of the retired military brass started coming out very concerned, you know, YouTube videos and whatnot. And, you know, the more that came out and, and uh, then, of course, the things you brought out on Pete show. And I had found that video about a week and a half ago from five years ago. Mm -hmm. that they were already working on that mastering the human domain concept right so, oh yes yeah so uh, so now you know obviously we're all very concerned about it and um, so I definitely wanted to get you on here and um, let you present the things that you found and what I usually like to do Lori is uh, let everybody have a chance to give a little bit about their background so you so our listeners know about you so tell us a little bit about Lori and how you ended up doing what you're doing today well, I'm a mother of four, a grandmother of four. <laughs> I used to run an animal rescue, and I've done a lot of volunteer work over my life, uh, whether it be for senior citizens or whether it may be for children. Um, I've always loved volunteering and helping. I used to write poetry, and I got out of that and started uh, digging into the corruption after Aurora. And um, also noticing with the Patriot Act when it was slipped into the Small Business Administration uh, bill. So right. that is what started me digging and doing investigative journalism. And uh, that right there is pretty much it. I, I write with freedomoutpost.com. 
I do a lot of different radio shows like with, with Pete or with uh, Resurrect the Republic Radio or, right. or different organizations that really want to get the truth out there. Right. And um, and so that that's what I do. I don't do it for money. I don't do it for any um, political pack, if you will. I'm not affiliated with any um, left, wing, left wing or right wing group. If you will, you know that political correctness terminology oh, that I'm yeah. talking. About. Oh yeah. Um, I'm not Republican. I'm not Democrat. I'll tell you what I am. I'm an American, and I'm standing up for every American that's out there. And uh, we need more Americans doing that. Yeah, I agree with you there. And and we we are kindred spirits because I've been on the air for almost a year now. Uh, you know, four hours a night, five nights a week at a minimum. That's the least mm-hmm. amount I've been on the air. Um, talking about the Constitution, getting America back on the right road, you know, bringing people the truth for no money. Same thing as you. It's, it's right. for, for me, it's just about, you know, I love my country and I want to do whatever we can to get the get the truth out. Right. Um, one thing very interesting to me, um, did you read Cheryl Atkinson's book that she put out in December called Stonewalled? No, I didn't. And uh, she retired out of CBS News last year and, and – her book is basically about what's happened to investigative journalism in the mainstream media. It's a very fascinating book, um, and we we have talked about some of that on this show and run some of her uh, speeches, like at Hillsdale College, where she's talked about um, that the White House is controlling the message, you know, that we're seeing on the airwaves. Um, so I mean, it's very alarming, and um, so I agree with you. I think America needs truth. Uh, someday I'd like to start a 24-hour news channel that tells the truth. You know, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, <laughs> that not alternative media and not, not you know what we've seen with the mainstream media, but really a mainstream outlet that is telling truthful news to America. Right. You know, this non right. nonpartisan, like you said, you know, government corruption knows no party. <laughs> absolutely, know. absolutely, and that's the way they keep us. They use that divide and conquer tactic. Right. They really do. Um, I'm part of this group and you're part of this group, so we have to fight each other. Right. And and that's not the case because because so many people are focused on that, they're not realizing that they themselves are helping to target themselves. That's right. Um, and the divide and conquer, the elite know that if they can use the divide and conquer and we're fighting ourselves, that they will win. If we unite together, they know there's no possible way for them to win. Right. So the only way for us to solve that is to expose the things that we're exposing, especially the psychological operation, because the, the worst part of Jade Helm is, is not the physical. It is the psychological. Right. And as you said, it does, it goes, it goes back way farther than, than just this little Jade Helm 15. This, this goes back many years. Um, Desert Storm, Iraq, Afghanistan. Um, it's amazing how far this goes back. Well, you know what's really interesting, and I know we're getting way ahead, and we'll get all this in order here in a minute, but right. um, what what's so really disturbing about Jade Helm, if you look back, when they were talking about mastering the human domain five years ago, they're talking about feeding all that info into a supercomputer, getting the data points, and then doing predictive programming on a community to find out how they're going to react in any given situation right now with the psyop aspect they folded into it now they're talking about manipulating the community based on that data absolutely I, I think that's what i'm getting out of it and and that takes it to a very insidious level because um, those type of operations i don't think should be being conducted on the american people and if it is and you know they should have full disclosure about what they're doing and the people should know they're doing psyops on us and you know so they're going to be messing with our heads and whatever but they're not doing that this is all very um i mean if you saw the council meeting from texas they didn't give those council members any information with which no. to make that vote and Gordon. i don't know no. how those guys could sit there and vote yes for that you know or even joke about the strategic strikes right you know um, the thing with mastering the human domain, it goes further than just social media. It goes, it's every aspect of human life, right? every aspect of it. And what they're doing when they're going in with these drills is they're learning 
every bit of the reaction. Who is going to be on their side? Who is going to be able to be paid off to accept the bribe for us to be able to do this? Who is uh, the strong ones in, in alternative media or mainstream media that's going to cover this? Right. Um, who is going to unite together? What politicians stand against it? The whole nine, every bit of the interconnections, this is what they're trying to learn. That's that's actually stage one. Um, let me tell you the document. Let me see if I can get it. And that's a, that's a huge amount of data in and of itself, what you just said. Mm -hmm. It was a very condensed way that you said it, but it really is a, a, um, a very complete profile of how America would react in these types of scenarios. You know. Right. And what happens is there is a document. I'm gonna pull it I'm gonna pull it up. It's called the USAWC. Here it is. And then I'm gonna pull it over to the screen. Uh let me hit screen share. All right. <laughs> Yeah, let me make you full screen here on our show. There we go. Hey, I'm pulling it over. Okay. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, USAWC okay. Civilian Research Project. Yeah. Okay. Now, this actually even has Jade Helm named in it. But if you go down to... Let me get the page. <clears throat> get my mug shot off of there. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna scroll down to page 15. And obviously this is a document everybody really needs to download. They really do, they need to study it because this really um, kind of gives you the beginning of the guts of Jade Helm. I mean, um, not Jade Helm, excuse me, Mastering the Human Domain, right. because that's what, what this one is about. Uh, let me go to 15, here we go. Okay. As you can see right here, can you see my mouse? Um, yeah, yeah, I can see. Okay. Yeah, I can see it. So it looks like a cursor right now. Right, right. right. Yeah. I just wanted to, I was wondering so that the audience could also see that. Yeah. Right here, it shows you um, parts of what mastering the human domain is. And it says the human domain is the totality of the physical, cultural, and social environments that influence human behavior to the extent that success of any military operation or campaign depends on the application of unique capabilities that are designed to fight and win population-centric conflicts. It is a critical and complementary concept to the recognized domains of land, air, maritime, space, and cyberspace. This concept and the addition of a human domain are important because other domains insufficiently address the human dimension of conflict although it is deemed a critical component to land power. Further, the addition of a human domain, similar to a seventh warfighting function, will ensure that we're providing a framework to support and employ the complementary capabilities of special operations and conventional forces. Now, if you go... <laughs> and did you find it very interesting that they also included space in that? I did. It stood out to me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. This is every aspect. When you go down to page 17, I'll scroll right there. Much like the seventh war fighting function within Army Doctrine, the human domain proposal creates conditions with do within doctrine to ensure that human who inhabits the operational environment in which military and interagency operates is considered deliberate consideration of factors within the human domain will assist in planning for campaigns, consequence management during operations, and post-offensive operations planning, specifically ensuring that we are not surprised by a populist counteraction to our efforts. That is what they are doing right now. Right. These drills, they want to know what are we going to do so they are not surprised with our counteraction. So... I will pull a different document over here. A lot of people, I don't know, have you shown your audience the Jade Helm um, document? 
We ran we ran your uh, your interview with Pete Santilli in its entirety the other day. Okay. So, you know, you okay. you showed some of the document there, but you know, obviously, there's going to be people here tonight that haven't seen that. Um, so, you know, what I thought I would do is just let you kind of take this in the order that makes sense to you, okay. um, and just present it out. And okay. um, and that also saves my um, you know throbbing sore tooth that's in my jaw here. <laughs> okay. Well, what we'll do then we'll start um, from the Jade Home document, and that way the individuals who have not seen this, they have the ability to see it. Right. Um, and then we can go from there, explain asymmetric warfare, psychological operations, and the things that I think. Um, and it is my personal opinion that are interconnected with it. So right. And, uh, and before you jump down that road, um, I, I have my, my own personal assessment here that the the operational documents on Jade Helm that is July through September for the Southwest is right. only one of several regions. And I think they're doing some of those operations right now. Do you agree? Absolutely. OK, well, see, the, the main thing about jade helm when you when you really dig and you research mastering the human domain this is a psychological operation on the entire united states of america and actually you know since the news is global you could say it was global too right um because it's the psychological they want to know what your reactions are going to be right. what are they going to do are we going to go after and recall council members are we going to demand that they send the money back and this that and the other are we going to have as some people who don't dig into it, so they start going um, off half cocked uh, because they're scared. Um, are you going to have people going into panic because of the black, um, the black hawk flying around, or the amphibs, which USA Today covered the uh, amphibious um, vehicles coming up onto the beach, which was a drill. Of course, that one did happen on a military base, so I'm cool with that. Right. But um, but the point is, is we need to get the information out there because that is exactly what they're trying to do. They want to know each and every step we would make if this were live. And um, that's not OK. It's not OK to do this to the American people. It is not OK for them to train on private land. It is not OK for them to train on public land if it is not military bases. Right. And it's uh, and, it, and it's a. It's a it's a very interesting way that they're doing this, um, requesting letters of invitation, and I know that puts it in a certain legal category. Yeah, it's very different than say getting permission. Right. A letter of invitation is a different legal animal, um, and you know maybe we'll talk about that a little later on. But you know, um, you see what I'm saying. One one way to do that would be for them to come in and do a contract with the city and the county, in the state. Um, that they're doing this and everybody agrees it's okay, but mm -hmm. they took the ex extraordinary extra step of making it a letter of invitation, which I found very interesting. Right. So, so it looks like they're not coming in um, by their will, but they were invited to come in sure. and do this. Right. You know, right. Um, and that's another part of the psychological operation. Um, okay. So this is the front page of the U.S. Army Special Operations Command uh, request to conduct realistic military training, or RMT, Jade Helm 15. Um, in this document, it states that the purpose is the commander of the United States Army Special Operations Command, or USASOC, seeks a written invitation, what we were just discussing, as a matter of fact, and approval from local officials to conduct realistic military training within their jurisdictions for joint military exercise, Jade Helm 15. Okay. What they claim realistic military training is. Realistic military training is conducted outside a federally owned property. The RMT process is designed to ensure proper coordination between Department of Defense representatives and local and regional authorities. The process includes the following measures. As you can see on there, it's risk assessment, medical, MOU, MOA, licensing agreements, training areas, staging areas, role players. So we're talking about crisis actors, people. Um, legal review, ID of training, staging areas, role players, airfield drop zones, and landing zones. And as you 
if you've played uh, what I um, covered with Pete, then I think you have probably also played the audio um, of the uh, Thomas Meade, uh, where he said that there was going to be surgical strikes. Um, and that would have been in Texas. So right. the um, the letters of invitation and the mayors and stuff like that, what they're getting is they're getting a one-sided, very short view from what appears, and, and I may be wrong on this, but everything I've researched so far, I have not gotten all the county commissioner stuff. So, but the ones I've researched so far, Thomas Mead has always been behind it up there talking to the county commissioners. And he... Um, they, of course, are offered $150,000 for their um, right. invitation. You know, I would like to know what the cost of the, to, to go off of this for just a second, I would like to know what the cost of the total drill is. Yeah, well, you figure if they're doing 150000 per county, um, right. you know, and you average it out, you know, how many counties are in each state, you know, I mean, you're talking about, you know, quite a bit of money. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Not including, you know, your your uh, fuel and your paying on the special operations that are involved, your interagency partners. To be honest with you, that's what concerns me more than anything in this is the interagency partners being trained with special forces. Right, and my and my question was immediately was what does the DEA and these in in the FBI, what would they be having to do with military operations because? They're definitely not going to be doing something with them overseas. Absolutely. So for them Absolutely. to be involved in an operation here, um, that makes it a different animal. I mean, that's a huge right. red flag to me, right? Right. And then they and then they want to say, oh well, it's for training in Afghanistan. It, it's for training in in um, Iraq, or or it's for training for when we go over there. No, it's not. Because if it was, you wouldn't be training law enforcement officers, Department of Homeland. You had breakfast. Um, you wouldn't be dealing with sheriff's departments. You wouldn't be dealing with people. I mean, how do we know that it's not IRS agents and everything else going to do training sure. with it? We don't know. That's we right. don't know. And, 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 and we know there's some mind games with this, and I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, everybody thought that our Department of Justice was just um, ignorant, that, you know, the hands in the air, you know, um, you know don't shoot thing with uh, Ferguson. <laughs> Yeah, that was and I and I guarantee you they they perpetuated the false narrative mm -hmm. to see okay. how the public would react to the false narrative. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Right. They um they were caught putting money into protesters for the Trayvon Martin deal too. Sure. Um, all right. So this is one of the reasons that there's such a concern for those of you who have not seen the document. The participants are going to be U.S. Army Special Forces Command, the Green Berets, the Navy SEALs, Air Force Special Operations Command, U.S. Marine Corps, Marine Special Operations Command, U.S. Marine Corps, Marine Expeditionary Units, and 82nd Airborne Division. Now, here's the kicker, the interagency partners. Each one of these groups, when you research them, if you don't know already about them, these are the highest, the highest trained individuals in our military. They don't need a little bit of extra training to know the terrain. Yeah, and was it you that brought out on Pete's show that they're all actually getting major funding that comes directly from the Council on Foreign Relations? That was Pete that found that, but okay. yes. Yeah. That was the same show, but that was Pete that, that did find that one. Right. Um, so, so the concern is we've got these special forces operators. They're going to be boots on the ground. We remember Katrina. That wasn't that long ago. Um, in Katrina, you had non-government organizations working with quote-unquote law enforcement and military, um, busting down doors, taking people's guns. Yeah, they did. Um, and um, did some really, really horrendous, horrible things. Now, I'm not saying that's what this is. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. But I'm saying the, the realistic possibility, and interagency partners do include or usually do include non-government organizations so that is another problem um the mapping on this of course are the states that are listed there's two other states that's actually involved in this drill and that's mississippi and florida which is not listed in this mapping right. i only found out about that because of 
what Thomas Mead said to the Board of Commissioners. Um, so you have miraculously Nevada, California, Colorado, they're all in the blue, which means permissive states. Red is considered hostile, brown is uncertain, leaning hostile, and light blue is leaning friendly. But that means they don't know. Conveniently, these are also the same states that are fighting back against the land grabs. Right. You know. Right, and I don't. I don't think that's solely. You know. Um, yeah, and you know, and, and obviously, this is probably just. You know, they're they're uh, for the purpose of their exercise. They're making some states the hostile states and the friendly right. states. You know, and I get that, but you're absolutely right. Um, there, there are things going on in those two states that have been very much so against uh, some of the policies of the federal government. So, right, right, and yeah. and you know the federal government doesn't like nullification; they hate it. Right. Um. And and they have. It is my personal opinion, and this is just personal opinion. I think they are mad that they have not forced us into a civil war yet, because we're handling things on the peaceful level, but we're doing it lawfully and we're using nullification to do it. Um, yeah, and I think something like Bundy Ranch just took them completely by surprise. You know? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Um, in here, they they try to claim that the reason that they that they picked Texas was because the Texans are historically supportive of efforts um, for preparing the soldiers and the airmen and Marines and sailors to fight the enemies of the United States. Right. Um, so that could also be another reason um, that they they've agreed because Texans are are very supportive of the military and you know what I love the military 100% love sure, them sure. I'm an ex-military wife I've I've done my time under that and um, so I love my men and women in the military 100% but you know what these this is actually going, mastering the human domain is being done on them as well well and, and here's the thing you know and I love the military too and you know when this first story, when the story started to break, the reason I told my my listeners out here let's exercise some caution is because we knew that there has been no uh, decent relationship between Obama and the military. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to to let all the facts come out um, and that maybe this was a way that our military was actually preparing America for the. Uh, possibility of martial law being declared where they actually would teach us to conduct an insurgency um, you know now as this has gone along obviously we found out that that's not true and this has a right. much deeper history yeah, um, but you know I was hopeful there for a few days that maybe we were getting some help out of the military you know right right but but and, but, but, but the key was finding out the special operations command is very much so under the auspices of the council on foreign relations and that tells you all that you need to know Right, and then when you really research the mastering the human domain, it it really opens your eyes. Um, it's very very concerning. It's concerning, and it ties somewhat back to the uh, supercomputers in Salt Lake City that the NSA runs. I know it does. Mm-hmm. Oh, everything is so interconnected. It's insane. Um, so we know. Um, I'm going to scroll through this. I'm not going to go through all of this because I'm going to um, go ahead and. I'm going to leave this right here for a second so that we can talk about that. But I want to let your listeners know, um, because it's very important to understand asymmetric warfare and unconventional warfare. Okay, unconventional warfare for special forces, their definitions of it, is special forces having long employed the use of unconventional warfare in enemy territory, unlike direct action missions which are generally designed to be quick strikes. Unconventional warfare operations can last months and even years. Unconventional warfare missions allow U.S. Army soldiers to enter a country covertly and build relationships with local militia. Operatives train the militia in a variety of tactics, including subversion, sabotage, intelligence collection, unconventional assisted recovery, which can be employed against enemy threats. This training can help the army prevent larger conventional attacks. And because the deep because of deep roots set up by these missions, other special forces tactics like direct action or special recognizance can be launched quickly and seamlessly. So Jade Helm, this drill, is listed under unconventional warfare. 
we need to remember that right and and for people that don't know out there conventional warfare is our guys with guns against their guys with guns and our right. tanks against their tanks that kind of stuff um you know unconventional warfare would be kind of like what the underground did say in world war ii in europe where, <laughs> they, where they fought you know to get rid of the germans you know um, right so right and then in um and i can't pull this one over I apologize for that because it's on my second computer. But um, it the manual is FM3-05.201, and it's Special Forces Unconventional Warfare Operations. All right. Do you want me and, to pull that up? Is it in the uh, yeah, you, folder? Yeah, you could. Okay, hold on a second. It should be. All right, bear with me here a second. Let's see. All right, what's the name of the document? It is, hold on, I'm going to go back to the top, up to the top. The number on it is three FM3-05.201. All right, I don't have anything titled that. Is it in a folder? Mm, possibly. Let's see, let's look. It, might be, it, might, it might be in the drive. All right, hold on. It'll, it's named Special Forces Unconventional Warfare Operations. All right, hang on. So while you're looking for that, if you want, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll read this to them. Psychological Operations in Unconventional Warfare. PSYOP units are a vital part of unconventional warfare operations. When properly employed, coordinated, and integrated, they can significantly enhance the combat power of resistant forces. PSYOP specialists augmenting the SFOD can deploy into any JSOA and plan the propaganda themes, messages, media, and methods to be used based on target audience analysis. PSYOP in contemporary and future unconventional warfare become more critical as ideological and resistance struggles increase. A temporary tactical advantage may create a long-term psychological disadvantage. All actions must be reviewed based upon their local, regional, or even international impact. PSYOP usually involve the following major target audiences in JSOA. Number one is enemy forces. Number two, enemy sympathizers. Number three, the uncommitted. Number four, resistance sympathizers. Number five, civil military operations in unconventional warfare and special operations imperatives. They are to understand the operational environment. So I said all of that to, to let the audience know that this is very serious to go in detail on the... Um, well, Mastering it's, it's, the human domain. It's categorizing all those groups of people, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that aren't going to go along. I mean, you just laid those out, you know, in those mm -hmm. in those five points. Absolutely. Right. Um, and, and it's to do exactly what they said in the lead document you started with, which is um, once they have a good scope on that and understand the, the uh, community there that they're in, um, that minimizes the possibility that they're going to be surprised at, say, an uprising to something they might do, you know. Right, right. And um, I have a, the other document, FM3-05-130. You have that, you should have that in the drive. Yeah, and the thing is, they're not titled, the, the names that you're saying. And for some reason, when I'm clicking these, they're not coming up in Safari, and I'm not really sure why. Maybe I need to be in... Um, um, Okay. Google, That's okay. Maybe I needed to be in Google Chrome. That may be what that's all about. Okay. Um, give so, me some moment and I'll pull that up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to let you, um, I'm just going to let you pull the one.
can and the ones that you can't, um, you know, read them. And then what we can do is you can let me know, you know, when we conclude tonight, um, any of these that can be made available to mm -hmm. people. And then, right. then we'll figure out a mechanism to do that. Um, okay. Let's see. I believe this one is. No, oh, this is it. All right. I'm getting ready to scan this over so everybody can see this. All right. All right. This is FM-05.130, Army Special Operations Forces, and, of course, Unconventional Warfare. Right. And um, I'm going to scroll down. B-22. So it's going to take me a minute. All right. <laughs> it's all right. That's all right. I just... Okay, well, I can show this before I go to B-22. Now, now, some of these I'm surprised you have. Where did you get these? <laughs> well, you don't, you, don't, research. You, don't, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to tell me if it came from, like, a source or something. But, I mean, this no, is... I'm this just is, very good at research. This is excellent. So I'm, I'm just very good at research. Um, some of these actually come off the military sites themselves. Gotcha. Um, others, you know... Wherever they uh, drop in from, right. Wherever they dropped in from, right. Um, seven, phases, seven phases of unconventional warfare. Before I get to um, Appendix B, I'm going to show you this just so the, the listeners can see this. It says each application of unconventional warfare is unique, particularly when applied against non-state actors. However, U.S.-sponsored unconventional warfare efforts generally pass through the following seven distinct phases. Preparation. Initial contact, infiltration, organization, buildup, employment, and transition. All right. Yeah. So, so really, actually, so really, yeah. uh, when you when you watch when you look at that flow, that's very similar to how the CIA recruits and utilizes yes. operatives. You know. Yes. Yes. Um, then, of course, in this document. Uh, it goes into a list of details about the infiltration, the organization, um, how they do that. I've given you access to that, by the way. Uh -huh. so, so you can use the link, uh, well, upload it to a different thing, and then you can use the link yeah. to give the people the documents. Right. Um, I'm trying to get to Appendix B because I think this is important. And it does beg the question, you know, why why are they, um, you know, why would why would they be conducting this type of exercises, you know, um, on the American public? You know? Right. Well, when you start really digging, it appears that it has a lot to do with the TPP. Right. Um, for the fact that um, Special Operations Command, their job and their um, what they're supposed to be doing is implementing the President's National Security Strategy. And the National Security Strategy in 2015, and I will read this to you because I don't have this in the document, but I printed it off. Um, the letter before it actually goes into the document where President Obama signed it. Right. Um, this is some of the most concerning things that I read, and I don't know how many of your listeners are aware of UN Agenda 21. Yeah, um, yeah, they're they're very aware about Agenda 21. Okay, well then they'll pick up on this really quick. Okay, um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is what it says. Now at this pivotal moment, we continue to face serious challenges to our national security, even as we are working to shape the opportunities of tomorrow. Violent extremism and an Evolving terrorist threat raise a persistent risk of attacks on America and our allies, escalating challenges to cybersecurity, aggression by Russia, and accelerating impacts of climate change. And the outbreak of infectious diseases ought to give rise to anxieties 
about global security. We must be clear-eyed about these and other challenges and recognize the United States has a unique capability to mobilize and lead the international community to, to meet them. Any successful strategy to ensure the safety of the American people and advance our national security interests must begin with an undeniable truth. America must lead. Strong and sustained, don't you love that word? Mm -hmm. Strong and sustained American leadership is essential to rules-based international order that promotes global security and prosperity, as well as dignity and human rights of all peoples. The question is never whether America should lead, but how we lead. And then if you skip down in the two paragraphs below, when complete, the trans-Pacific partnership will generate trade and investment opportunities and create high quality jobs at home across a region that represents more than 40% of the global trade. So, when you go further down in his lovely little letter, it also has, we are shaping global standards for cyber security and building international capacity to disrupt and investigate cyber threats. We are playing a leading role in defining, in defining the international community's post-2015 agenda for eliminating extreme poverty and promoting sustainable development by prioritizing women and youth. Mm -hmm. um, so if you know the, the trigger words, you would see that the national security strategy in and of itself, especially when you go into the national security strategy is dripping with UN Agenda 21, it is dripping with trans the TPP, and um, of course, which ushers in the North American Union. And um, so this is why this is a concern because Special Operations Command, what is their job? Their job is to make sure that the, um, national security policy is is done if to all their ability um give me one second and i'll give you the exact quote of what <coughs> excuse me okay the exact quote And this is in the U.S. Army TC-1801, Special Forces Unconventional Warfare. All right. Okay. And it's in Chapter 1, and it's on 1-2, Figure 1-1. Unconventional Warfare Terminology. The Role of Unconventional Warfare in the United States National Strategy. Three documents capture the U.S. National Strategy, the National Security Strategy, the National Defense Strategy, and the National Military Strategy. So they actually reference the document. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, see, that that's... I mean, that's that, that ties it, clearly that ties all that together, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And then I don't know if you knew this, um, WikiLeaks um, released some um, documents the other day that were, I guess, supposed to be classified or right, right. hidden anyway and it had to do with the TPP where the where the foreign countries if they brought business over here and it didn't do as they expected that it would do they can then sue the states or they could sue the people and uh, the people are on the hook for it right um, so in other words is, in other words for people who don't understand what Lori just said it circumvents our US court systems so if you have foreign companies that have made investments here in the United States they can really go externally to an international, they're going to use tribunals, which is alarming, you know, just to see that in print. Uh, but they're talking about using these international tribunals to decide whether or not, you know, our country or our government made policies that harmed their company. And then our government has to pay. Right. right. Which is which means us as taxpayers. Right. Right. Absolutely. And the thing is, if you remember. Do you remember in the NDAA when there was indefinite detention of American citizens without charge or trial? Right. 
Then afterwards, everybody threw such a fit, which they should have. Um, they threw such a fit. Then Congress does this cute little bill that was supposed to fix that. Well, what they fixed was they agreed to military tribunals. They did not agree to regular due process of law. Afterwards, Rand Paul ended up actually speaking out about it after he voted for it. Now, here's the other thing, too, about this TPP. And it's also true for something like this agreement um, the Obama administration is trying to do directly with Iran. Mm -hmm. International agreements and treaties require a confirmation with a two-thirds vote of the Senate. Mm-hmm. or they have no weight. Here's another interesting thing that a lot of people don't know. Treaties are not law. No, they're not. So even if they're confirmed by the Senate, they're not hard. any country in a treaty or an agreement can uh, can counteract, you know, can do complete contrary to what was agreed upon with no ramifications. There's, right. no, there's no international court that would say, well, you broke your treaty, so now you're in trouble. You know, so, right. Well, um, what it is is they're trying to get everybody into that. It used to be called New World Order. Right. <laughs> right. Now it's the New International Order. Yeah, they like to, they like to change this stuff around, right? Right, yeah. but we all know it's the same thing. So um, that's what they're doing. And in order to do that, this would also make sense and and make people understand why um, earlier last year, the Department of Homeland Security was escorting criminal aliens across the country and dropping them off. Right. Yeah. This is doing away with the borders. Right. And um, I find it ironic that anybody can come in, but American citizens have to be patted down and show IDs and get permission from from our uh government to be able to leave to come on a trip i mean that's that's kind of well what was really alarming last summer we covered this on the show you know you had pilots that were coming forward and blowing the whistle on that they were they were being told uh just the charter guys that were taking people out of country they were required to bring people back when they flew the planes back to the united states and they're flying them directly to cities nobody's documented you know, they land at, you know, small, untowered airports, that sort of thing. And just, you know, these people get off the plane and, you know, SUVs and whatever, be sitting there waiting on them or buses. And, and they would just be released into the population. Right, right, absolutely. And it's all part of it. Yeah. It is all part of the bigger thing. And, and they're, everybody's focused on these little things and they're not seeing the bigger picture. Just like, let me give you an example. Well, they had us all focused down at the border, right? In Marietta right. and places like that and kids <coughs> and, and all that stuff. And and while they had us all distracted down there, they were just flying people in by the tens of thousands all over the country, you know. Absolutely. Very insidious. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, there is in FM3-05130, Appendix B, um, and I'm going to cover what's on the screen in just a moment, but it's important for me to um, let the people know this first. Um, this is called military deception. Uh, MILDEC are deliberately misleading actions executed for adversary decision makers as to friendly military capabilities, intentions, and operations, thereby causing the adversary to take specific actions or inactions that contribute to the accomplishment of the friendly forces mission. MILDEC and OPSEC are complementary activities. MILDEC seeks to encourage incorrect analysis, causing, now you heard that, seeks to encourage an incorrect analysis, right. causing the adversary to arrive at specific false deductions while OPSEC seeks to deny real information to an adversary and prevent correct deduction of friendly plans. Right. So I'm not going to go any further than that. This is all part of psychological warfare. Right. Or a psyop. Just running an effective disinformation campaign and a propaganda campaign along with it to, to, to back that up. 
Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And um, what they're wanting to do, they're wanting to see how everybody reacts in every facet, whether it be social media, whether it be alternative media, whether it be the commissioners. How did they react when they were offered that to invite those military and how are our military going to be treated when they're there on the ground? Are people going to go start and trying to recall? Are they going to actually have charges pressed because of violations of posse comitatus, which they tried to do away with? And this is my personal opinion, just because you write it on paper doesn't mean it's gone. Yeah, and I, I tell you what, too, I guess what I learned from that county commission meeting is they're, they they learned there, I'm sure, they can prey on the patriotism of uh, people out there uh, b because they do support the military um, that they're they're letting their normalcy bias not not make them ask any difficult questions right, right? absolutely absolutely and um, and the problem is is they are in this by out they're getting the people there are several facets okay you've got people that are getting desensitized to seeing it all the time so that they get trained to see it as normal you have the military guys who are in their training with interagency partners. They are being desensitized to think this is normal and it's okay because this is the order, even though Uniform Code of Military Justice says you need to disobey. If it is an unconstitutional order, you're supposed to disobey it. Right. Um, you'd be surprised how many of our military do not know that. Right, and they and like I said, they they've got the normalcy bias too, just like that uh, city council that the guys in charge are all good guys, and you know it's the American military, and they're all going to be doing good things, and you know we don't need to ask a lot of questions, you know. Right, and so our military are not only being trained for that part, so we're having the expanding standing army because of the interagency partners. And you have to also um, look at the fact that if the people react in a negative manner, which they should to a point, you know, you need to stand up, you need to tell these commissioners, no, you send the money back, this is not okay, stuff like that. But if you have people that start attacking the military, the, the, the military that are actually following the orders, okay, and you have them attacking them verbally and, you know, everything else, flashback, Vietnam when they came back, you know what I mean? Right. Um, then, then what happens is the military automatically are going to say, they hate us, they're our enemy. So the people are seeing them coming in doing drills. Well, they must not care about us or they must not care about the Constitution because they're doing this and it's a violation of posse comitatus and so they see us as an enemy because we see all of these nice little documents that Department of Homeland Security and Department of Defense put out about right wing. Oh yeah I mean they yeah. and they, they did a, a new one for 2015 here a few weeks ago that you know restated it and focused um, you know the, the biggest threat now, that's what it, that's what the new position paper said this year. The biggest threat, um, you know, to to America is domestic. You know, the possibility of domestic terrorism from, um, you know, Christians and you know, uh, people that you know love their Second Amendment rights and, you know, basically good, normal, decent Americans that love their Constitution. Right. You know. Right. And you know how sickening that is. And, and just for you saying that, in the 2015 National Security um, Policy Strategy, excuse me, in the strategy, that's ironic that you would say that because um, the statement in there, let me give it an exact wording, because it was discussing terrorism and then it discussed that we are not at war with Islam. Right. That's absolutely right. Right. And um, so, so people need to really, and I'm going to tell you, I know most of our guys will not turn on us. I, I believe that. I really believe that because there are sons, there are daughters, there are fathers, there are mothers, there are family. Now, with that being said, 
Well, that being said, I think they're going to bring in a lot of these illegals, and they're going to. We we've already had the documents come out that they're going to give them a path to citizenship by doing two years of service in the military. And not only that, remember, special um, special operations command and uh, joint military task force. Right. Joint military task force, of course, has troops from all different countries. Right. Okay, which is, of course, you and NATO. That's right. But what happens is, do you remember approximately a year ago, President, it was either a year, year and a half ago, somewhere around there, um, where uh, President Obama and Putin made an agreement to borrow 15,000 Russian troops. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I sure do. And it and, and it was worded like to defend D.C. or something. It was really odd. It was a very odd wording, from what I remember. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So how do we know they're not already here? We've sure. got sightings of Russian troops that are already here. We know. Um, and you know, I don't have anything against the Russians either. I don't have anything against anybody. No. You know, I really don't. Um, I love all of humanity, and I want this this mm. stuff to stop. And it's not going to stop unless we stop it. Right. And, right. Um, but I want our military to know that we do support them. We do love them, but we do want you to wake up. You are also under this psychological operation. And um, it, it's time for you to stand and say no more. Because this, the, the United States government has been already overthrown and if you can't tell that by the documentation that is readily available it is unclassified yeah if you cannot tell that something is wrong you're not paying attention you're not paying attention at all um all okay, right so, all right so so before you transition and you're going to go through this flow chart mm -hmm. um we're in an hour so let's take a quick little you know minute and a half two minute station break and then we'll come back and uh, you can pick it up from there Wonderful. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Sisk. You're watching and listening to American Liberty Live, and we will be right back. All right, this is Jeffrey Sisk, and you're watching and listening to American Liberty Live. And uh, we're on with our special guest tonight, Lori Anderson, and we're talking about Jade Helm 15. And um, all right, so I'm going to uh, send it back over to you, Lori, to kind of pick it up where you uh, left off here a minute ago. All righty. What we're looking at right now is the U.S. Army Unconventional Warfare. This is the PDF. And if you notice, um, phase one, the preparation, <coughs> excuse me, I apologize. Sorry. The, it, it states, the resistance and external sponsors conduct psychological preparation to unify population against established government or occupying power and prepare population to accept U.S. support. Now, this, of course, you have to remember these documents. A lot of them reference overseas, and they reference overseas because the unconventional warfare, the mastering the human domain, um, asymmetric warfare has all been used over in Afghanistan. And, uh, and, and in our, Ukraine also, as a matter of fact, uh, yes. um, this phase right here, um, you know, uh, U.S. Uh, you know, people in, from the State Department were caught at one of the colleges sending out social media messages um, against the Ukrainian government before they brought it down. You know, the, right? Yeah, right. And you know, all that was is it all goes back to the bankers. The same thing. Um, you follow the money. It's always back to the same right. globalist, elitist bankers, and. My hope is to reach everybody and wake everybody up and let them realize we need to unite as a people. It is not black and white or Republican and Democrat. They don't give a rip about any of us. We no, are they considered don't. No, they fraud. Don't. They don't. They don't. And, and also the same thing with like Ukraine. What's so really sad there, they went in and they, <clears throat> they, they used, you know, World Bank, IMF money, to really buy off the oligarchs there, mm -hmm. um, that money never got to the Ukrainian people, but mm -hmm. now they're going to be expected to pay that back, you know. So we've now enslaved that country to the you know the debt system, 
you know, like all the other countries that are enslaved to this central bank, you know, fiat currency kind of system. Right. And, right. It's, and it's a shame because, you know, they're, um, you know, like I said, the oligarchs, the bad guys over there that were willing to be traitorous and turn on their legitimate government, they got paid off by us. You know, yeah. it's disgusting if you really think about it, Lori. I mean, this stuff, oh, it is disgusting. This stuff's because, being done in our name, you know, in the right. name of the American people. Right. And and even worse to me was they, and to me, the worst thing is mainstream media goes along with it. Now, I understand George Soros has controlling factors of almost all mainstream, of right. the mainstream media right. at the 140 newspapers. I know all this, so I understand why, but that's still not the point. The person sitting behind that camera, do they not, to me, I couldn't do it even if you paid me to do it. Well, they lose Does their job. Sense? I mean, that, that, that's kind of, you know, it's almost that same thing about, um, you know, a lot of people that are public servants that don't come forward and say something because they're, they're thinking about their, um, you know, their pensions, their, you know, their family, their you know, are, are they going to be, you know, slandered through the media, you know, if they come speak out and, you know, is it going to ruin their life? And, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people don't do the right thing and come forward. Um, here, Here's the other thing that's disturbing is when we're out there doing things like, like in Ukraine, over, overthrowing a legitimate government like that, um, the world looks at our country and knows from their outside perspective that we democratically elect all of our leaders. Mm -hmm. So they're going to come to the conclusion that we're willingly putting these guys in, in power, you know, that are doing these things. Yeah. And it's sad because, you know, a lot of the stuff that's going on, it's not common knowledge to the average American, you know, right. and, and it's, it's really alarming if you think about <coughs> it because there is a perception out there in the world that the the uh, population here supports this behavior, you know. Right, right, and I don't want them doing that in my name. No, I don't either. I, I really don't. Um, and you know, I know that a lot of people. Um, you're right. It, it's the paycheck, and it's the family, and this, that, and the other. But sure. when, when does it hit you enough that the money doesn't matter, and you find a different career? Right. When do you get to that point? When do you get to the point of looking them right in the eye and saying, you know what, I'm not doing this because even though I'm thinking about my family, I'm thinking about my family and that is why I have to stop doing this because this eventually will target my own family. Well, here's the this scary answer to that question. The scary answer is most of the people in politics have been bred into politics. They come from yeah. political families they already know this system. Yeah. They're already aware of what's going on. You know, normal people out there like you or I, <clears throat> if, if we got put into office, um, something like that came up, we would immediately spurn it as something we wouldn't do, right? We wouldn't even have to think about it. We wouldn't even right. have to get to a point because we're already at that point because we're morally decent people already. Right. But a lot of the people, unfortunately, that are in power that have been put there, by the money that controls the banks and the media and you know and and all those forces out there um those guys have already been acclimated to that system and and they're they're really following marching orders from the guys that wrote the checks that put them in office right oh i know they're puppets yeah i know and and the sad thing is can you imagine being them and having to look yourself in the mirror. I, I can't, and I've said that before on the air. I mean, how can you how can you do these things and, and look yourself in the mirror? You know, right? Absolutely. Here, here's the other thing I've said on the air. These guys have children and grandchildren, and they'll have great grandchildren, and don't they care anything about the generations that are coming after them? Right. Because right now they're acting in a very selfish manner. It's about themselves and their own power and, um, you know, whatever money they can make. Um, you know, these guys in D.C., like you said, there's less than a 1,000 guys in D.C. that are not listening to the American people. 
and they're running the future for 300 and something million Americans. Right. And we're letting them do it. Right. Right. Absolutely. And that's why we have to stop this. Right. We, we do. Um, lives are in danger. I mean, really they are. Um, I'm getting ready to slide over another document. Um, from what it looks like is it looks like phase one and phase two um, is what's going on right now. Right. Um, phase three, of course, is infiltration. They have to do those drills to, uh, if you remember in the Jade Helm document, it says they're going to be dressed as civilians and maybe driving civilian vehicles. Right. Okay. Right. Well, you know, that's also a little bit uh, conspicuous as well or shady thought to me, and I'll tell you why I say that. Because in the um, recording that I heard Thomas Mead say, he said that it's going to be done from 11 to 4 a.m. Now, right. how are you going to mingle with the civilian population at those hours? Right, especially in a small town, man. Most small towns board everything up about 9 in the evening. Right, right. absolutely, absolutely. So that, that also um, is another thing that's kind of um, question marked in there. So what I'm doing, the page that I have up now, this actually comes out of Defining Asymmetric Warfare, the Land Warfare Papers. Right. Okay. And it's out of the Institute of Land Warfare, AUSA. And if you notice, and I'm going to highlight this for everybody so they can just see where I'm reading. This is another type of war, new in its intensity, ancient in its origin, war by guerrillas, subversives, insurgents, assassins, war by ambush instead of by combat, by infiltration instead of aggression, seeking victory by eroding the exhausting and exhausting the enemy instead of engaging him. Okay, that goes hand in hand with what they are doing with mastering the human domain. Sure. So how do we fix this? How do we change things? I would say there are several ideas that I have. Will they work? I don't know. Um, but I definitely have some ideas. One, if the population in the areas that they are doing these drills um, sign on to a class action lawsuit. That's one. The globalist elite and the ones who are behind this do not like when, when it comes to money, okay, they like their money. They do not like lawsuits. It would not only draw attention, it would also make it go into the court system. Thus, they've been notified lawfully. Okay. Well, what I said last night, too, is also these communities could put pressure on their county commissions and yes. on their city councils to rescind the letter, get them to rescind yes. the letters, right? And they should. Yeah. They should put it in writing, not just verbally. They need to put it in writing because in legal terms uh, or legalese, if you will, if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. Okay. And that's in law. Um, but I would put it in writing. I would... I would also go to the county commissioners, have a bunch of people over there speaking out about it um, and and try to move it that way. Also, get a hold of the state representatives. I know they usually don't, uh, depending on who they are, uh, they usually aren't going to listen. But you know what? Talk to the um, attorney general. You know, talk to Greg Abbott, especially in Texas. Ask him, can this fall under 18 U.S. 241? Right. Now, 18 U.S. 241, I'm going to pull that up so individuals can read this because that is an important statute that most people are not aware of. So I'm going to pull it up so they can actually see it so they know I'm not making it up. Right, <laughs> right. Because um, <clears throat> That's extremely important. I'm all about proof. And yeah, I'm and it's, it's good for people to see it, you know, and, and know that, right. it's, you know, they can touch it, feel it, look at it. Right. You so know. give me one second. Let me switch this over to where they can actually see what 
I'm getting ready to cover on this if I can mute. And definitely this listening audience on on this show, yep, uh-huh. they, they want to see it. No doubt. Okay, about it. Got, good. Got good, smart listeners out there on this show. So okay, um, this is 18 U.S. Code 241 and its conspiracy against rights. Okay, now this is an important code. Why is this such an important code? If more, if if there's at least two people and they don't have to do it knowingly. That's the kicker with this code. They don't have to do it knowingly, okay? This is what it says. If two or more persons conspire to injure, there's the conspire part, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district in the free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege secured to him by the Constitution or the laws of the United States, which is the U.S. Code, or because of his having so exercised the same, or if two or more persons go in disguise on the highway or on the premises of another with the intent to prevent or hinder his free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege so secured, they shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both. And if death results from the acts committed in violation of this section, or if such acts include kidnapping or an attempt to kidnap, remember that NDAA? Right. Aggravated sexual abuse or an attempt to commit aggravated sexual abuse or an attempt to kill, they shall be fined under this title or imprisoned for any term of years or for life or both or may be sentenced to death. Now, here's the thing, though, about the NDAA. If, if, if martial law was ever declared, all these statutes become null and void because the, uh, uh, the country is now under a, you know, direct rule by the military. I mean, it suspends everything. Well, yes and no. The martial law, we've been in the soft form of martial law since the 30s. That is how come you see so many unlawful things going on in D.C. Yeah. Um, that is why they get by with the executive orders and Congress stands up there and pretends like they're throwing a fit, and they're not. It's because of um, we've been in the soft form of martial law already. These yeah, kind of- yeah, and if you look, too, we've also been renewing every year since 9-11, we've been renewing the state of emergency from that. Right. Yeah. We've been in a state of we emergency. Just did I believe it, it was since yeah. I believe it was since nineteen thirty six. It's right there in that in that range. Right. Um but, but we've been in a state of emergency, yeah. But I mean even with uh, the thing from nine eleven, we're actively renewing it every year. It just happened here right. about six weeks ago. And I mean right. you know, president's signing a new renewal each year of the state of emergency. Right. Um, and it, it puts a legal status on everything, and you're absolutely right. It changes how how the law works. You know? Yeah, it does. But here's the thing. Let's say we do uh, we we do in writing, by the way, an affidavit form signed under penalty of perjury to be true and correct. Why? Because that stands as truth unless it is disputed in a court of law. Okay. So when you do that, they've been notified. If they don't respond to it within the days that, that you file that, it's considered as complete truth. Now, so then what happens? You have the U.S. Code and you have the Constitution backing you up for them to be able to be filed with charges. Yeah. Well, then check your states on if it comes down to it, and I pray to God it doesn't, but if it comes down to it, let's go to the big if. If these uh, council members refuse to, to pull back and do what is right because this is violations and they refuse to uh, send the money back and, and do what's right for the people. Okay, worst case scenario, after that is done, check your citizen's arrest laws because most states have citizen's arrest. If you know or you have the belief that they have convinced they have uh, committed a felony, then you are allowed to place them under citizen's arrest and deliver them to the sheriff. Right. 
so Here, there here's is the other thing do you know that. dan johnson that started panda panda yes, I, do. I don't know him know him but i do know of him i have been on his radio show there's like 30 something jurisdictions that they've convinced um to pass laws to negate right. the ndaa i mean which right. I, I think is awesome you know well see and here's another thing about that buyout why is it so important for them to have this buyout to convince the american people that we are overwhelmed there is nothing we can do they are just they're too powerful right okay well let's flip that that's psychological operation they know that the people are fighting back they know that uh the people are winning with nullification right so they're in panic mode and and i'm talking about the globalists at this point they're in panic mode <coughs> excuse me their agenda 21 is being exposed left and right it's being nullified things all across everywhere right is um is actually um huge uh everywhere so yeah we can make a difference but they don't want you to believe that so what happens with that is how do you stop the people from fighting back how do you stop them from regaining their land? How do you stop them from getting rid of the communist core? Um, or I'm sorry, common core. Huh. Um, it, how do you stop all of this? Because you have over 355 million Americans. Right. So we got the numbers. We yeah. have the numbers. And what it is, is they want us to individually feel like, like you notice they're picking small towns. Yeah. Okay. Where there's not a lot of people. So how do you make somebody feel like it's hopeless? We just have to follow what they say or they're going to, they're going to kill us. Well, it, you would, know, it wouldn't I mean, take I mean, a lot to make a small town. You know, you, you, you bring in some Blackhawks and, you know, um, you know, couple of thousand right. troops or whatever doing some operations in the area and you know people are going to look around and they're going to feel very small and insignificant holding their 12 gauge shotgun right and that is the reason for it yeah it it's because once you have been pushed down to a point through the psychological operation you won't even fight remember desert storm yeah okay in desert storm you remember when when um was it Saddam's men that uh, they were on the beach and they threw down their weapons? Yeah. And they raised their hands and say, we give up. Right. And they turned themselves into our, that was actually part of mastering the human domain. Sure. Because they, they had already, uh, you know, convinced them that they were such a superior force that they didn't even try. Right. right. They didn't and try. that's what's going on. That, along with psychological operations on our military, and I don't care, I will tell all of your listeners, and I will tell anyone in the United States of America, it is not okay to do psychological operations on our military either. Right. Leave our men and women alone, let them do their job. Their job is to really protect this country, not to be the political pundits of the UN and NATO. Right. I I will. And they and they do, and they do the same, yeah, and they, 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 you know, they, they would do the same thing there because, you know, somebody that's very low on the totem pole in the service would feel that overwhelmingness of, you know, how would you ever overcome that if something happened, you know? Right. Yeah. And then they don't know what to do. They're stuck in this dilemma. They're being given orders and you know, they're pushed through, um, in the military. It's you obey, you do not question, um, you are basically their robot, but right. you're not. You're not. You're a number to them. You're not a number to us. Right. And that's what we need our military men and women to understand. They're not a number to us. They're not insignificant. They're being targeted by this administration, whether it be health care, whether it be the generals that um, conveniently retired or, or got taken out because of gambling, um, or you have almost 200 sergeants and lieutenants that have that have been removed from the military in the last two years why 
because they wouldn't go along with the plan. Right. Okay. So we have all of that. And there's so many that don't understand if we would just educate each other. Yeah, that's, that's really, it's that simple. This yeah. is what would happen. Nobody would be able to break us. And they really need to understand because this is not a joke. America is the world's last stand. Yeah. The world's, not just this country. Well, I said this the other day when I was on John Wells' show. He, I said, you know, um, here's what's at stake here. Um, what happened when um, uh, Rome fell? Do you know? What happened when what? When Rome fell. Oh, what are you talking about? The Vandals and Visigoths? It plunged the world into the Dark oh, yeah. Ages for a thousand years. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And when you look around at the world, even with the meddling that we were doing, that they're doing in our name out there and all that stuff, America still is that stabilizing force in the world mm-hmm. that, you know, a lot of the bad powers that be don't run amok. Mm-hmm. Because they know there's consequences. Right. Right? You take America out of that equation, and you're talking about literally uh, plunging the world into probably another Dark Ages type of thing where you, you've got a lot of bad powers out there that are going to invade their neighbors and take over. Oh, yeah. You know? Well, you know, you know on that topic as well i think people around the world realize the american people themselves are not the enemy it's the elite and the corrupt and the government right. they realize that um i saw when um when egypt happened and uh they had the millions of egyptians over there in egypt and the military had helped them and and uh put morsi in jail and took Egypt back Um, there was three Egyptian men holding up this huge sign and it made me cry it really did because on the sign it had it had a picture of Obama and it had an X and it said supports terrorism and no Obama and then it had a picture of a female I didn't recognize her but I think it was somebody that was affiliated in Egypt and it had an X on her and it said no such and such and then at the very back of it it had an american flag and it says message to the american people we love you just not your government yeah right you are not our enemy right and that did my heart so well because at least those four individuals right there knew they knew that it's not us the people we're not calling the shots because if we were calling the shots our men wouldn't be coming home in body bags our men wouldn't be dying at 22 or more a day from suicide right. because we don't have any need to be over there doing interventionalism to, to put in globalist banks. That's right. We have no need to go over there and implement ICLEI. If you notice Syria, for example, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but before 2009, uh, Assad was really great with the White House. Assad's not that evil man that everybody is saying that he is. Okay, Uh, what happened in 2009 was uh, Saudi Arabia, and they wanted a natural gas pipeline. They wanted it to go through Syria, Qatar, and Turkey are involved. Assad said, no, it's our sovereign land. I'm going to do with it for our people, for our sovereign nation. And it's over a natural gas pipeline. But it's also, if you check the ICLE map, you will notice that ICLE is not in Syria. The places where we're having war, Italy is not in. Right. And people need to wake up. We're not in war. They're invasions. We haven't had one world war declared since World War II. Well, you know, I had a guy on last night. His name's William Bloom. Mm -hmm. And um, he's like 80-something years old. But he was um, originally in the State Department. You know, he's a very young man. But he's written a book. And we've like, we have like deposed the governments of 50 countries since World War II, over 50 countries. Uh, we've right. also um, knocked off like over 50 world leaders in that period. 
Um, I mean, he he has all this laid out in his book, and he was talking about it. Um, I think the title of the book is America's Most Dangerous Export Democracy. And, you know, right. it's kind of a playoff title because that's not really what we've been exporting. <coughs> but it's like you said, these are... Um, they're not like World War One or World War Two, where you had a world war and it was declared and, you know, we're all fighting together in a common enemy and, enemy and all that. These are meddlings in the world where, where we've taken down uh, somebody that's not doing things that, that, that our government considered to be in their best interests. Right. And, and what is it our business to go over to somebody else's country and tell them how they're going to run it? Right. I'm just curious about that. Right. You know, just like, and, and other people go, oh, Lori, you just don't understand. No, I do understand. I have researched it very heavily. Here's the simple question. You know, our founding fathers warned us we should not be taking sides in conflicts around the world with, with countries against one another. And they also warned us about foreign entanglements. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So um, they, they said we should really stay far removed from that. You know, have, have diplomatic relations with the countries of the world, but don't get entangled in their you know wars with one another and don't take sides you know don't get involved with their battles for, for one thing it bankrupts a lot of countries they were worried about right. that you know right well on top of that it makes you also wonder if we were not doing that how many of those wars in the middle east would actually be going on in the first place because a lot of those started with this unconventional warfare right it started. And a lot of it had roots in the Cold War, where Russia was back in one side and we're back in the other side. And, uh, you know, we, we have, um, you know, Middle Eastern countries basically fighting a proxy war for us against Russia. Right? I mean, we've got two little countries fighting each other, and one's backed by us, one's backed by Russia. That's how a lot of that stuff happened in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, that's just like the, you remember the Arab Spring? Yeah. The, the Arab Spring was not Syrian. The Arab Spring was sent in. It was a perfect divide and conquer. Well, listen, yeah. Code Pink and all these organizations from here mm -hmm. were over there. I remember hearing something about yes, that. Yes, they were, they were involved in Tunisia. They were involved with Libya. Um... I mean, the, you you had um, SEIU was involved. There were some mm -hmm. of their guys over there. So what were American unions and American political activist organizations that are funded by people like George Soros, what were they doing over there in the middle inciting the populations and teaching them how to use social media, you know, to do a revolution, so to speak? It's very interesting. And well, it, they're trying to overthrow Assad because Assad won't put the international bank in, and he won't go along with the natural right. gas pipeline. And, and, like, and like in Egypt, he won't be their puppet. The first Arab <laughs> Spring, you know, Obama installed a Muslim Brotherhood president. Yes, right, sure did. And I and I tell you what, you mentioned it a minute ago, but a year later, that was probably the most extraordinary political event in world history. You've never seen 30 million people spill out into the streets of a capital city in the history of the world. I'll tell you, I cried. It was when I amazing. Saw that. that was so amazing. And you know, just looking at that, this is what I ask our military or uh, individuals who are listening. When it comes or if it comes down to that, will our military? keep their oath and stand by the people the same way that the Egyptian military stood by their people. Will they do that? Or will they go the way of taking commands like, like Hitler's men did and end up in Nuremberg right. later? Well, I'll tell you what, you know, what Egypt, Egypt's military did, um, you know, and they've sort of been a controlling factor in that country always. Right. Um, right. Is they 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 kept that country in trust until the people could right. get a properly elected leader in place. Right. And I don't know if you saw him. Uh, he gave an interview um, with Brett Baer. Uh, I don't know a week or two back. The leader of Egypt, the one now Al Sisi. Al Sisi. And it was the most amazing. He's talking about religious diversity and that their country and, you know, 
um, you know, that they have Christians and they have Jews and they have, you know, Muslims and everybody's living together in harmony and that they, they want that type of, of society and um, where nobody's pushing religion on anybody else. This is a leader of an Arab country saying this publicly. Right. You know, and, and his people love him, right? Right. I mean, I, I'm just, it's extraordinary to see these things taking place, especially against the backdrop of what you see going on in Iran where you have the Ayatollahs in power. Right. Um, you know, you look over at what's going on in, in uh, Pakistan where there's a, you know, still very much influenced by the <laughs> Taliban that's, you know, around their borders. Um, the military is very infiltrated in Pakistan with a lot of those radical guys. Um, you know, you look at ISIS now that's spilled out all across Iraq. So to have a Arab leader come forward, you, you really truly have um, the closest thing to, you know, um, a Western democracy in Egypt, really. And it's not because it's, you know, it's obviously a different form of government. Right. But right. but they're they're welcoming those things. They're giving freedom to the people. Right. And you know, before this uh civil war um or war against terrorism happened in Syria, the same thing was going on. The Christians were living with the Muslims and 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 there wasn't um Right. And and Assad had like a 77% approval rate. Right. Right. And, and he's not some chummy fuzzy little bear. Don't get me wrong. No. But he had the support of his people. But you got to right. understand in these in these countries that they have a lot of these radical elements that are in the undercurrent of society. The population knows if they don't have a strong leader, right? Or like in Egypt's case, a strong military that's a stabilizing factor. They know that those radical elements can step forward and take over. Mm -hmm. So. They will take the dictator that they know might roll with a heavy hand and do some bad things every now and then, but he's keeping them safe and keeping their country safe. Right. Right. Absolutely. And you know, this is I tell people this all the time. I'm not saying Assad is perfect. I'm not saying any of these other but you know what? I don't know one human being that is perfect. Right. Not on this earth. I don't know one. And it is not our place to choose for the Egyptian people or or the Syrian people who they should have as a leader. We're not even over there. Well, and, and, you know, and, and you know, you look at, talk about Assad and the chemical weapons and all that. People can make that same case about us flying drones around all over the Middle East over there and killing people. Well, you know, they, they debunked that, right? Assad didn't do the chemical weapons. Yeah, I, I know was, that, but I'm yeah. just saying they try and say that and say, well, he's right. a bad guy. But, you know, in the same light, you know, we're flying drones around over there and we're killing whoever we want and we're yep. we're killing people with collateral damage, you know, right. with impunity, you know. Oh, absolutely. It's it's insane. Yeah. And um, you know, I just my theory is and I know it may not be the popular one, but hey, I'm just gonna speak from my heart. My theory is bring our men and women home. Let them come here and let them protect our country like they're supposed to. Sure. We have borders they can deal with. <laughs> we have Let's, we have bases all over the world. We do. It's like do. It's, it's like ridiculous. we have tried to militarize the whole world. And and I, I agree. I think you know some of those we we want to leave open, but 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 truly, the majority of that could come back here. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And then and then you would see less suicides you would see all this other stuff let's start with fixing our own country before we try to fix somebody else's it's obvious by looking at our country right now we're in no place to try to fix other countries right we're just not you know even biblically uh, get your own house in order before you start talking about somebody else and um and and that's just the way it is we need to get our men and women back here we need to uh, take care of our men and women. We need to quit allowing them to be targeted just because they retire. They have sacrificed so much for us. Right. So much. Well, I think we should. I think we should take that advice from our founders. I think we should try and avoid foreign entanglements. Right. And uh, you know, there's other ways economically that we can, um, you know, through foreign policy that we can. You know, we can get what we want out of countries. You know, if we really want them to do something a certain way, 
Um, we can do that by making the right deals with them, right? We don't have to do it by dropping troops in. You know? Well, I think a lot of times if people would step back and think, you know, if you start treating other countries the way you want to be treated, right? nine times out of ten, you're going to have those agreements without any problems behind it. Right. You know, because when you, when you deal with people one-on-one -on -one and you're real, not some fake propped up puppet that's being pulled by George Soros or Rockefeller or whoever it is that's being pulling, doing the pulling. But, but if you're real, people know that. Yeah. They can tell when they look you in the eyes. Or is this person a liar? You can tell. You can tell if they're being true. You know, and that and that's that's the one thing I will say. You know, for for getting America to stand up and us getting control of this back and getting good people in government, it, there would be a period of years for the world to unwind. Right. From what they have been expecting from us. Right. Right. As as we became that that. You know, our, our founding fathers said that, that for our Constitution to work, that we needed to be a moral and decent society. Right. And in a lot of ways, the power, the corruption, um, you know, the big money, um, you know, really turned America. And we really have a ruling class, the money that puts the politicians in office. When you have to have a billion dollars to run for president, and that's what they raised in the last election each, a billion dollars to run for president, okay? then you you absolutely we have a ruling class now because the average person can't go run for president now right see and that is to me that's about as sickening as it gets because as long as you are a natural born american citizen i believe you should be able to run for president and it shouldn't have anything to do with the money it should have to do with the morals right everybody should get some equal airtime Right, of the candidates right. that emerge well, yeah. that are being supported you know, by the people, that everybody should get equal airtime to, to say what they believe. Right. You know. And give give the the people that choice. Right. And um, our our system's been hijacked so long ago. Been hijacked. And and it really has. And I wish people would wake up and they keep saying the U.S. government. It's not truly that is not who's running things yeah you know um the u.s government is much different and i won't go into it right now but the the united states is much different than the united states of america yeah and so many people don't realize that until you until you start really researching and digging in codes and into their codes and you find out okay there's a corporation and da 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 and right. they're limited to 10 miles square and <laughs> you know right a whole bunch of stuff. Well, if people just realized the 10 mile square, think about this. Yeah. In 4 U.S. Code 72, it states that all the, and it, this is an exact wording, obviously, but the, the corporations or the groups that are under the United States are limited to 10 mile square. Right. So, EPA, right. DHS. You can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. But people first have to realize, okay, where did the 10 mile square come from? Well, it depends on which one you want. If you want U.S. code, it's uh, 28 U.S. code 3002, 15 A, B, and C. But if you want Constitution's Article 1, Section 8. Right. And, but they have tricked the people with legalese and changed the meaning of words. So, well, unless, yeah, there, there's no reason that they should be laying claim to 95% of the land in a state like Nevada. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, did you hear about um, AB 408? Yes. And I, 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 Isn't I it wonderful? did it get out of committee because I had Clive Bundy on here day before yesterday to talk about it. Oh, he's so sweet. And, How's he um, doing? <laughs> uh, he's doing good, and, you know, I've enjoyed him. We've had him on here. Before he was on the other day, we've had him on here uh, twice for three hours each to just give him a chance to, you know, for people to get to know him. Right. Because, you know, what they got on the mainstream media is a couple minutes here, a couple minutes there. Right. Um, when, you, when you let him on and really get the whole history, 
you know, you find out there's a man there that's very knowledgeable about his constitution. Oh, yeah. And he knew the entire story all the way back to 1933 about what happened with the BLM. Right. And and he articulated it very well. Right. You know? But uh, somebody got an email blast on Friday or Monday, so I just called him up out of the blue, and he came on for about an hour and a half. And we, oh, ta- and we talked about the bill. But do you know if it got voted yes out of committee yesterday? I'm um, not sure, but I can check real quick yeah. while we're sitting here. I, have, and, I haven't and had a chance have, to find out if it was successful or not. I will definitely find out. Um, I will. Because what that will do is that lets it go forward now where it has a chance for coming up for a vote in the full legislature. Oh, absolutely. Right. So um, I have a funny feeling. I'm sure it did. It had a lot of Richard Mack was going out there. And, yes. Yes, um, he was. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people. Pete Santilli was supporting it. Right. So there's um, a lot, a lot of popular support for it. And um, all right. And then there's some kind of thing coming up in April on the one year anniversary of Bundy. A lot of Bundy. A lot of guys are going to go out there for the one year um, anniversary of what happened. I think Pete's planning on going out there as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think he is. I'm pretty sure. Right. I'm pretty sure. All right. Let's see. I'm going to click to see on the bill, and we will see if it got out of committee. Fingers crossed. Yep. I bet it's on Carol Bundy's site, too. Yeah, that's what I did. I accessed my email. <laughs> Let's see. I cheated a little bit, there okay? <laughs> there we go. Bundy Ranch. Yeah, I'm just getting the actual paperwork is what it is. I'm not seeing whether it passed out of committee or not. Right. Well, maybe they hadn't had a chance to uh, to, to, update. to get it updated. But uh, but I haven't. I'm amazed I hadn't heard anything about that um, over the last 24 hours because you know you you would have thought people would have put some videos out about it or something. You know. Well, what I'm pulling up right now, AB 408, and this is on the. Nevada Electronic Legislative Information. Yeah. And it says the meeting for March the 31st, um, it says that the minutes are not yet available. Okay. Is what it says so far. So, hmm. fingers crossed. I'm fingers really crossed. hoping for right. the Nevada people. I'm telling you, right. they deserve their land, and the federal government needs to get off of it. Well, I'll tell you what. It was suddenly reassert the right that um, I think Clive said is 95% of the land they're claiming out there ownership of. Well, yeah, and the sad thing is they're using a lot of that with UNESCO. Yeah. Okay, UNESCO sites, and UNESCO is UN. That That's not even sure. the corporate federal government. And you know they what's really interesting sites. about that is, you know, they stepped in to manage the the land rights and he said just all of a sudden out of the blue 23 years ago like in 93 92 they just all of a sudden started claiming ownership there was right. no legal basis for it um there was no precedent for it they just all of a sudden dubbed themselves the owners of all this land it's really alarming if you think about it it is but um it's a u.n agenda 21 sure, bush sure it is i mean um the great thing it's very long but if you read it um it's very much worth reading it because it gives you the blueprint of everything they're doing right everything they're doing including the transportation and the i've got mapping that um let me see if i can pull it up actually i'll I'll, if i've got it where i think i've got it i'll see if i can screen share to show you what I'm talking about on this mapping. You know the Wildlands Project mapped, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, well, I've got the the um, Department of Transportation map. And um, if you were to overlay it over the Wildlands Project map, you would see let me make sure this is it. It is the same thing. 
right. Right. Okay, now this includes HUD. I'm getting ready to use screen share real quick. Right, and I did um, convert back over. I've got you back full screen here. <laughs> okay. So. <coughs> All right, I'm getting ready to pull over. Now this is HUD, De Department of Transportation, HUD, and the EPA Partnership for Sustainable Committee. Most people have not seen this one. Um, you know, I've just learned to hate that word sustainable. I know because you know the trigger words, don't right. you? Yep. But anyway, right here's the mapping, everybody. And as you can see, if you were to overlay that over the wildlands project maps, it would be identical. Right. So, um, and of course, they're all interconnected. Every one of these alphabet agencies, show me somewhere, please, just anywhere, show me anywhere in the Constitution where those alphabet agencies are constitutional. Well, tell me uh, well, let me tell you what they've done here. As a matter of fact, they've gone against it. Because I've talked about this a lot, right. a lot on my show the last year. This constitution right here, well, you can't see it because I have the video off right now. But I have a little pocket one on my desk all the time when I'm on the air. Mm -hmm. This constitution says that con Congress has the sole authority to make law. What they've done when they delegated their authority to these big government bureaucracies mm -hmm. is they have shirked their responsibility that was given to them under our founding documents. Yep. And what's so bad about that, Lori, is now the people have no way to hold those bureaucrats accountable and vote them out of office. So we lost our uh, ability for the American people to have their grievances redressed. Right, because that's really the way our government was set up, where you had a direct line to the lawmakers themselves. You had representatives that you elected in your state, your House of Representatives, right? <laughs> right. And, and you could go to those guys, and if they were doing things that were bad for the American people, you could vote them all out and change everything. Right. Well, they, they delegated away their lawmaking authority to a lot of these agencies. Yeah. But, you know, the Constitution doesn't limit the people. It limits the government. And just because they do it doesn't mean that it's legal or lawful. They claim it's legal because they've read all this whole stuff. Oh, yeah. But, like, but reality is it's not even lawful. Not Just like no gun laws. They're, yeah. they're unlawful. They are. Yeah, any gun laws. Any gun laws. Even, oh, even them saying you have to have a carry permit in your state, stuff like That's that. Those are all unconstitutional. Yep. Right. It is. And and so they created ATF. Well, ATF's unlawful. Right. And then get off the constitutional end of it. Why would anybody want to register with ATF about their weapons when ATF is funneling weapons to drug cartels and has caused over 200 deaths in Mexico yeah. and, what, over three or four of our op how many officers was that for uh that's been killed inside the united states with fast and furious weapons you know i don't know the number but um i know there's a, I know I know it's there's happened a, yeah um what was his last name brian was it terry yeah yeah that's it um but i mean you've got fast and furious weapons that have killed leadership in Mexico that have killed beauty queens, that have killed women and children, and where is the individuals that were behind it? They are still walking around as if nothing matters, no handcuffs, no nothing, because what? They think they're above natural Well, law? you know, when you when you have a guy like Holder in the, um, in the uh, Department of Justice in charge as Attorney General, right. nobody's going to be held accountable. Right. Well, right. Alder was involved with it right. as well. Now, many people don't realize, because everyone's always screaming, Obama, Obama, Obama. Okay, well, before Obama was Operation Gunrunner um, in the Bush administration. However, they, they did at least track the guns in uh, Operation Fast and Furious. They didn't, and many lives have, have been lost, and it's, it's just it's sickening to me. Yeah, it is. is sickening to me, especially if you want to tell them citizens to you have to do this because of this and and you know you have to do all this wait a minute why am i going to take any advice from criminals i mean really yeah i mean really why should you you know because these are
criminals, yeah. the ones who um, were behind that. Right. And um, I mean that that's no different than going out and talking to a, a gang banger, the gang banger, and and getting an unlawful weapon and somebody getting killed with it. Oh well, you're going to be under the jail. Right. Just because you had something to do with the, the weapon, even though you didn't pull the trigger. Right. Or you let a um, person act in self-defense, and they go through the ringer a lot of times um, when it's self-defense. But they don't hold themselves to that standard. They, they deal with the arms, and they deal with it. And, you know, here's another thing. I cannot stand how many people sit here and they want to talk bad about those rifles. They call them assault weapons. First of all, there's no such thing as an assault weapon. Assault is a verb. It is an action. It is something that is done. A weapon is a tool. It is a noun. It's a person, place, or thing. Okay? That tool cannot do the action. The person pulling the trigger that moves their finger pulls the action. Now, what another thing that drives me nuts with that is you have individuals who all through mainstream media will sit there and say, oh, these automatic weapons, they're just like military. No, they are not. They are semi-automatic weapons. One finger, you pull your finger back, and you're only going to get one bullet out. It's not going to keep flowing. No different from that than a deer rifle. I mean, the same, same thing. You know? It's no different than from a revolver. Exactly. But do you know how many people don't realize that? And then they're going to sit there and talk all that? We've got people over four, I think it was like over 450 people that were found dead from uh, on the border um, that were ones that were trying to cross, criminal aliens um, that were trying to cross. Uh, I don't know if it was before or if it was on the, or if it was on our side of the border. But I know this happened like a week or or about a week ago right. that they that this started coming out in the news. Okay, more people have died from trying to cross that border illegally in just that one report than people who have died from quote unquote assault rifles. Right, that's right. You know, um, you, it's a ridiculous thing that they try and paint those as um, you know some sort of a military weapon because they in no way does something like an AR-15. Um, come anywhere close to the destructive uh, stuff you could do with like a fully automatic M16. There's not even a comparison. Well, not only that, you know, a lot of people go, oh, Second Amendment, da, 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 it's for hunting. Okay, first of all, everybody hunted in those days. If they didn't hunt, they didn't eat. Second of all, right. it was for a tyrannical government. Now, you can try to claim all you want. They had muskets. They had cannons, too. Right. Okay, let somebody get a cannon today and see how fast they start screaming gun control. Oh, yeah. So these people who use that musket theory, they've, they've lost their um, blooming mind because they wanted to be as well armed as the military. Well, and the, and the mistake here was is the, you know, when we stopped really uh, keeping up state militias, um, that were under, you know, say the governor, instead of instead of having them in a place where they could be conscripted into service by the president, um, you know, our state militia should be as well equipped as, you know, this military that we've created in America. <coughs> be, because right. the, the people should have equal force if they ever needed it against that government if it became tyrannical. Well, not and they've that. controlled who can have those types of armaments. Well, the thing is, they they don't have a right to control that. And you no, know, I don't, don't know if you, I don't know if you've read the Dick Act, but it's very very interesting. And um, you know, it lists about the um, military, it lists about the militia, um, and it lists about the unorganized militia. Everybody is the unorganized militia. Yeah. You know. And if people really want to save money and, and, and they let, – let's look at it from a monetary value, okay? If everybody would just arm themselves, and I'm not talking about individuals that can't handle it, okay? I'm yeah, talking about – Yeah, normal people, yeah, right. 
that are able to conduct themselves in a moral fashion were to arm themselves, okay? You would have less people that are needed for police officers on the streets. Sure. That's a fact. Oh, Look yeah. at Kennesaw, Georgia. Okay, they went from a population of 5,000 to 29,000. They went from a crime rate that um, included rape and murder to a crime rate on violent crime to zero for 25 years. Right. They have approximately, if I'm remembering correctly, I may quote this wrong, but if I'm remembering correctly, I think they have like four officers. Four. You know why? It's an ordinance. They have to own a gun. Right. Now, so if everybody would do that, we would save money on police um, having to hire police. We would save money on, we wouldn't have near as many, um, we wouldn't also have to have Department of Homeland Security come in. Why? Because we're protecting our own selves. Sure. Even if we're protecting right. ourselves, we end up inevitably protecting the neighborhood. So we wouldn't need Department of Homeland Security. So good Lord, how many billions would we save? We wouldn't need near as many police. How much more liberty would we have? Oh yeah, because the, the people would be, uh, uh, well, we wouldn't have this big, you know, if you didn't have this big Homeland Security thing, um, you, we probably wouldn't have this uh, big surveillance state that we have today. Absolutely, you know? so. absolutely, it all interconnects. And you know, the more I looked at it, the more I did a video on this actually, and it was, uh, it was talking about the woman's responsibility, not just her her Second Amendment right. Not, it's not just her right; it's her duty. If if every woman or female that has a child would train, learn gun safety, and and have her weapon, okay, just in and of herself, make the commitment to protect yourself and your child. Right. Now, can you imagine how safe those neighborhoods would be because females are almost in every house. Yeah, yeah. And actually okay. and actually too, females are very, very good shots for whatever reason they have good aim you know the firing range you know whenever i've taken somebody to the range they're they're very good with firearms to be honest with you yeah um, but but the point is if you have females over down down the road you're not going to have you might have some petty crime you know somebody breaking into a car when nobody's out there that's it but but you're not going to have the the rape and the murders and stuff like that how many criminal i i've listened to time and time attend time again interviews with prisoners that said they won't go into Kennesaw, Georgia. Why? Because everybody's armed. Well, absolutely. And look well, at the yeah. crime look at the crime rate in Chicago. That tells you all you need to know. It's toughest oh, toughest gun toughest gun laws in the world. All right, let's That's take a true. let's take a quick little short break and then we'll come back and then I'll give you a choice when you come back. We can either wrap it up or then you can take some questions from some of the viewers if some people would like to get on and ask some questions about Jade Helm. Okay. Uh, or whatever you would like to do, we can just kind of take it from there. All right, dear. All right, this is Jeffrey Sisk. You're watching American Liberty Live. We're here with our special guest, Lori Anderson, and we'll be right back. 